This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is the This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. Come on, sing that again. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. Come on, every voice, I'm desperate. Desperate for you. And I, I'm lost without you. Oh, we're desperate, Lord. Come on, sing it again. I'm desperate. And I, I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate. Lift your hands and sing that to the Lord tonight. I'm desperate for you. as we keep playing, just start lifting your voice up to the Lord. Come on, from the front to the back, tell him you're desperate. Tell him you're hungry for him. Oh, desperate Lord. 
Can you sense the presence of the Lord here tonight? Come on, lift your hand to him. Man, I am so thankful for the presence of the Lord. I am so thankful that we can speak the name Jesus and the whole atmosphere shifts. Do you believe that? no matter what we're walking through, no matter where we're at, no matter how far we've strayed from him, we can speak the name of Jesus and he's right there in our midst. Come on, can we sing this out together tonight? Every voice. I just wanna speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Come on, let's sing that again, church I just want to speak the name of Jesus Shout this out. Your name is power, Lord. Your name is power.
right now, let's start lifting up the name of Jesus. Start speaking Jesus into your situations. Come on into the lives of your children, into your marriages, and to those things that seem like they're dead. Come on, one breath from the Lord can revive your situation, can revive your finances, can revive your marriage. It's not just a song we sing. It's not just words. This is the breath of the true and living God. And I believe that one breath can change it. Come on, do you believe that? Start shouting out that name of Jesus right now. Come on, start calling those prodigal sons and daughters home. Come on, start calling those dead marriages back to life. Lord, we speak your name. We declare your name into every situation, Lord, into every broken heart, Father, into every person struggling with depression and anxiety, Lord. We shout the name of Jesus. Come on, church, shout out the name of Jesus right now. Every voice, declare his goodness. Declare his power. Declare his sovereignty. Come on, he is able. He is moving. Oh, come on, let's sing this out, one voice. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Oh, come on, sing that again softly, every voice. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, have a word from the Lord tonight. Let's just listen to what the Lord has to say in Jesus' name. The Lord says, if you look around you and you see the signs of the times, you should not be afraid, says the Lord. 
Because if you look at Moses, he stood on the mountain and I said to him, go. And he said, Lord, I cannot go. But I told him, go, because I had a plan. And I was going to do the work through him, says the Lord. And he faced Pharaoh and he overcame. And he came to the Red Sea, says the Lord. And he did not know what to do. But I was there and I told him. And I parted the sea. He came in the desert and there was no water, says the Lord. And I said to him, speak. And water came. I spoke to Gideon and I said, go. And Gideon said, I cannot go. But I said, go. And through 300 men, he overcame the enemy, says the Lord, because I did the work. David, when he faced Goliath, he never said, I would do it, he says, but God will do it. And even so, if you come and you look at the cross and you see my son there, and they said it's over, but it wasn't over, says the Lord. Because it's not by might or power, says the Lord, it's by my spirit. And when my spirit came over that dead body, says the Lord, it was raised to life. And I want to remind you what's written in Romans 8. If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead live in you, he will give life to your mortal body because it's not by might or power, says the Lord, but it's by my spirit. And I want to remind you that I never told them how I was going to do it. But I promised them I would. And tonight I tell you the same thing. Go. And as you go, I will do my works in you and through you, says the Lord. You will see the glory of your God. For when you stand against the giant, I will slay them. If you come against the onslaughts of the enemy, says the Lord, know that he's a conquered enemy and you have the spirit of the conqueror within you. Therefore, my people, do not fear, but go and fulfill my purpose, says the Lord. Proclaim my gospel, raise the dead, heal the sick, open the eyes of the blind, and know that I will do the work through you as you go. Thank you, Lord. Let's just lay hands on somebody next to you. For some reason you don't want to do that, that is fine. Just lay hands on somebody. Bobby, would you pray for needs tonight? And maybe you've already done this once, but that's okay. Share how you came to know Jesus when you got saved and born again. And then pray for all the needs, if you would, please. So when I was about 20 years old, 21 years old, uh, my dad had invited us to come to this church for one of the Christmas productions, and he said, why don't we just join? And we weren't really apart, but I said, all right, let's just do it. And so it was through that that the Lord used my love of music to bring me and draw me closer to him. See, I got saved when I was about three, four years old. I took the Lord into my heart. So at a young, young age, and, and that's why it's so important for us to teach those young kids that are in those classrooms. Because at a young age, we can get saved. And we may not have that intimacy or know the Lord, but you know what? When we get raised up, we come to know the Lord. Jesus draws himself to us. And it was through that that I came to know the Lord. I came to walk with him. And God delivered me from drugs. He delivered me from alcohol. He delivered me from addictions. Now, one point in my life, I walked back into the world. 
my life crumbled and I walked back into the world. But you know what? I am that prodigal daughter. Don't stop praying for your sons and your daughters. I am a prodigal daughter that returned home thankful to the Lord. And once again, God delivered me from drugs. God delivered me from alcohol. God delivered me from smoking. He gave me a wonderful marriage. He gave me amazing children. And my life is his life. I will always, always from here on out make sure that my life is lived for him because I owe him my life for saving my life. So we just come before you, Lord God. And Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you that you died on the cross for each and every one of us. We thank you that you atoned for our sins, Lord God. Father, we thank you that, Lord, even when we weren't worthy, you made us, Lord God. You created us, Father God. And you said, you know what, you're my children, and to me, you are worthy. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for coming. And, Lord, you are the name above all names. You are the name of de above depression. You are the name above anxiety. You are the name above mental illness, Father. Lord, we know that you can heal all sickness. You can heal all disease, Lord God. Oh, Father, we just call upon you right now. And we ask that you would touch each and every person that has an ailment, Lord God. Each and every person that has a sickness, Lord God. Lord, I ask that you would heal them. Touch them from the top of their head to the tips of their toes. Lord God, we claim healing over our bodies, Lord. And when the enemy tries to tell us that you can't do it, Lord, we know that you can do it because you are above all. Thank you, Lord, for what you do. Lord, thank you that you provide for our finances, Lord God. Lord, there are people in here that are struggling, Heavenly Father. There are people in here, Lord, that need jobs. There are people in here that are living paycheck to paycheck that may not know where their next bit of money is going to come for groceries. But, Lord, we know that you are the God of the provider, Lord God. And Jesus, we just thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for every provision that you give us. We thank you for every need that we, we lay upon you. And Lord God, you provide each and every need for us. We honor you. We love you. And we praise you. We praise you for all that you are. And you are the God. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Lord, we thank you. Lord, we just worship you. We continue to worship you, and we glorify you. It is through your precious and your almighty son that we pray. Amen and amen. Shout Thank Jesus you, Lord. Come on, shout Jesus tonight. And Jesus in the street. I don't hear you. Come on, shout Jesus. Jesus. In the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my Come on, let's put our hands together if we could, all of us. Those of you that are online, those of you that are upstairs, come on, put your hands together and shout Jesus. Come on, some of you have always wanted to shout Jesus. You got the freedom to do it tonight. Shout Jesus. Oh, come on, we're going to keep praising him. It's a night to celebrate. 
Thank you, Jesus. Come on, everybody, from the front to the back. Let's all be engaged. Let's all be involved. Let's all praise him. Thank you, Lord. Turn to greet one another. Love one another. In the name of the Lord, then you may be seated. the Lord. We are glad that you are with us tonight in the house of the Lord. Good to have you. Good to have those of you that are up in the cafe on either side. Good to have those of you that are online here at CCWC. The Lord is on the move and the Lord is doing great and awesome and wonderful things. Anybody in here in love with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Can everybody say his name tonight? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Great to have you tonight. We want to see if there's anybody here for the very first time. We're glad to have you in the house of the Lord. If this is your first time with us here at CCWC, whether you're online or here that is present, would you just slip a hand high up in the air if you would tonight? Good to have you in the house of the Lord. God bless you right back there. Anybody else way back there in the back, upstairs, down the right back there also? Great to have you in the house of the Lord. Our ushers, our host and hostesses, they have a guest card for you. And uh, also, the welcome behind me, there's a QR code. You can also scan that QR code if you're here tonight, and you can register with us. Right after the service, we do have a guest reception upstairs in the uh, guest room. It's in room 200. Come on up, please. We have some goodies for you, but more importantly, we want to get to know you and let you know it's good to have you in the house of the Lord. How many of you know it's important in any ministry, in any church, that people have a sense of belonging, and we want you to feel that the Lord wants you here, not just as a number, as an individual, but that we care and we love you with all of our hearts. And how many of you are glad Jesus loves you with all of his heart, all of his soul, and all of his mind? Well, I think it's time to give. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing to do, to give to the Lord? I believe it is too. Thank you for your generosity over all these years. All the people who have given in the church, outside of the church, the Lord is providing just as he is providing for you. He provides for us as a congregation. As long as we stay right with the Lord, as long as we have the heart of the Lord and do what he is asking us to do, then he will always provide our every need. So, Father, we just pray, Lord, Lord, and we thank you for this wonderful offering. And I pray for people, Lord, that they would become givers, gracious givers. Lord, we know in the Old Testament it says the tithe gets into the New Testament. Jesus says, I want you to be a gracious giver. So, Lord, we're going to be gracious givers tonight, Lord. We're going to give as you lay on our heart to give, Lord. And we do it with gladness. We do it with joy, Lord, to help build your kingdom. And, Lord, we'll be sure to thank you and honor you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray and all the people said. Soccer started tonight for first through sixth graders. They have almost 130 kids that are out there right now, not only playing soccer, but how many of you know we preach the word and we give them salvation. A lot of kids get saved. Wasn't Bobby's testimony awesome? Get them saved as a young person. We'll see what the Lord wants to do. Do we have any ladies in the house tonight? Ladies in the house tonight. Ladies night out, May 3rd and Mother's Day, 6 to 9 p.m. And then there is Mother's Day special. So moms, all the month of May is special for you. You can sign up out on the floor. You can also sign up online. Also new groups are starting this coming Tuesday. Child care is available, men's and women's, and also couples. As we reorganize our groups, we appreciate you for being a part. Don't forget, Josiah Queen is going to start his tour. The Lord is not only raising up missionaries, is not only raising up pastors, but he's raising up musicianaries, and Josiah is one of those. And uh, he is not, uh, I am not speaking for him personally. What I am saying is he's not here to promote himself. We are here to promote Jesus and what Jesus wants to do. He's going to start off his new tour because they're going to be gone for a couple months, and he's going to start it off. He said, Pastor, can I start it off here? So yes, I said, sure you can. So on April uh, April the 11th, uh, 14th at 7 p.m. in the Ministry Center, and uh, you can be a part of that. There are tickets available that go toward his ministry. Come and be a part. Don't forget Communion in Cans this Sunday and be a part of that. And again, a lot of outreaches are taking place. Second Saturday outreach was is a week from this Saturday. We have our Sunday night outreach. We have our outreach at the courthouse. We have just apartment outreaches. We want you to be a part of 
going. How many of you know that was a good word from the Lord, wasn't it? To go into all the world and preach the gospel. And last but not least, don't forget, we have some great GEDA materials that are out there after Easter materials and gears. There are two books that are for sale from Reach 365. One is It's Time for a Breakthrough, and the other one, which I'll start sharing on this coming Sunday for a month or so, it's The Invisible World. They're on sale from 10 to 7. Make sure that you get those and are a part of what the Lord wants you to do. How many of you want to? How many of you brought your Bibles tonight? Would you lift them up high in the air and shake those Bibles around? If you don't have a Bible, make sure you look on with somebody next to you and make sure you get into the precious Word of God. Does everybody know where we're going tonight? Where we're going tonight? That's right. We're going to the Gospel of Mark. You say, how long are you going to be in Mark? A long time. We're only in Chapter 2 right now, only in Chapter 2. I figure by 2031 we should be finished with the Gospel of Mark. We'll see how many are faithful and stay in the church till 2032. Mark Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And again he entered into Capernaum, as our ushers receive our second offering, after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. How many of you know there's nothing better than Jesus being in the house? Oh, that wasn't very good, Lord. How many of you know there's nothing better than Jesus being in the house? Oh, it's getting better. How many of you know there's nothing better than Jesus being in the house? You see, that is the first, that is the first quality that every church needs. We need Jesus and we need his presence. We need Jesus and we need his presence. These five principles that the apostle that the Mark gives in Mark chapter two are five principles for the church of Jesus Christ here in the United States of America. And every church has to have these five qualities. If they're not there, go to another church and attend another church. Very important that these qualities are in every church in America and every pulpit. The first one is, is that Jesus is in the house. Turn to somebody and say, Jesus is in the house tonight. Jesus is in the house tonight. How many of you are glad for Jesus and how many of you are glad for his presence that brings joy and healing and victory to each and every one of us? I just noticed, I don't know if you noticed that uh, they just passed a hate crime bill in Scotland. Isn't that amazing? And they said you can't do anything to offend certain communities or certain, certain groups of people. And you know what that's talking about? That's actually talking about, hey, you can't be a born again believer and preach the gospel. But I got news for the nation of Scotland tonight. Are we ready to say the name that is above every other name? Jesus. How many of you know we're not going to let anybody cancel preaching on Jesus, telling people about Jesus? How many of you are glad he rose from the dead and he died and he is alive that we might have everlasting life? Can we give praise to Jesus, the Son of the living God? Take that, Scotland, take that. He was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And look what he did. He preached politics to them. Don't you love Jesus? Knows how to preach politics. Look at that. He preached a motivational speech to them. Isn't that wonderful? What did he preach to them? Everybody tell me. He preached the word of God to them. Aren't you thankful for the precious word of God? Can you say amen? That's the second principle that we need to have in every church. And they came to him, bringing him a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when he had broken through, some of your Bible says when they dug a hole in the roof. I love New King James Version here. It says that they, when they had broken through. How many of you know every church in America needs a breakthrough? Can you say amen? Needs a breakthrough. How is that going to happen? With Jesus and his presence being there. How is that going to happen? By the word of God. And if you'll notice here in verse number three, it says he were carried by four men, that paralytic. What does four represent? It's directional. It means from the north and from the south and from the east and from the west. What is it talking about? It's talking about evangelism. How many of you know the word of the Lord came forth? We didn't orchestrate this. We don't get in a room saying, Pastor Johan, you prophesy on going. Liz, would you sing some songs on going because I'm preaching on going. I just sit back and say, Liz, you just sing what the Lord wants you to sing. Pastor Johan said he had a word from the Lord. The word from the Lord is go. He didn't even know what I was preaching on. How many of you know evangelism is for us to go and preach the good news of the Lord and Savior Jesus? Christ. Can you say amen? Turn to somebody and say, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. So when it talks about four men here, what is it referring to? It's referring to evangelism. And this principle needs to be in every church in America. It represents direction, north, south, east, and west. We need people saved in every direction and from every part of the world. That's why evangelism and outreach here at CCWC is now called REACH. You say, why? Because we want to reach out to our community. We want to reach out to the foreign field. 
We want to reach out to the USA. We want to reach out to the unreached. You say, why, Pastor Strayer? Because there are 61 million people who die every year. There are 160,000 people that die every day. There are 5 million people that die every month. We need to reach people for the Lord because there is a heaven and there is a hell. And I don't want anybody to go to hell. I want everybody to go to heaven. How many of you want your family members and your friends and your loved ones and your neighbors to go to heaven shouting victory? Can you say amen? Come on, give him praise today. We want everybody to be saved in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, what is the definition of evangelism? Evangelism is when people are so zealous and so on fire. Is anybody zealous and on fire for Jesus tonight? Oh, yes. Evangelism is when people are so zealous and on fire and passionate for Jesus that they, in turn, tell others about Jesus and set them on fire. How many of you understand, on Sunday, we gather together, but guess what happens on Monday? We deploy. We go into the workplaces. We go into the child care. We go into the restaurants. We go into the grocery store. We go to Home Depot. We go to Lowe's. How many of you know we, as born-again believers, we go every place? Why does the Lord send us there that we can tell others about the King of kings and the Lord of lords and plant seeds and see people born again through the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My mom, she's in a, uh, she's in a home called Vitality here. It's a real nice place for her. She's going to be 100 years old in July. And as I walked in, it was a couple weeks ago. Uh, Susie had, wasn't with me at that time. When I walked in, there's a whole line of people that are just seated outside of Vitality. There, there were three people that were there. How many of you know the Lord didn't bring my mom there just so I could go visit her, although I do? Guess what I do? I witness to those that are at Vitality. How many of you know the Lord put my mom there, and he just didn't put her there to take care of her, which we do, but also, there's people there that need Jesus. So I was walking through, and I stopped and talked to one man, and I said, sir, do you know Jesus? He looked at me and says, listen, I would be so stupid not to know Jesus. I said, I can tell you're born again and saved. He says, I sure am. When I was a little guy, just like Bobby said, I received Jesus as my personal Savior and Lord. He says, what do you do? I go around telling people about Jesus. He said, there's a lot of people in here that don't know Jesus. Make sure that you tell everybody that they need Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord and need to be born again. How many of you know if all of us do that, there would be revival and renewal and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our community? Can you say amen? Oh, yes, there would be. There would be. Now, these four men brought the paralytic to Jesus, but we must be careful that we don't limit bringing people to Jesus just on Sundays to a service. Yes, we want to bring unbelievers in. Yes, we want to bring family members in. But listen, if we only do it on a Sunday once in a while, that's all we do is to bring people at church at times. But listen, the Lord Bible says here that these four men brought people to Jesus. What does that mean? They didn't just bring people to a church service for an altar call. They themselves went out and they spoke the word of God and they shared the word of God with family members and with friends. How many of you know, again, we are all strategically placed in different places tomorrow that we can do what? That we can not only just go to work, that we can not only just make a living, but that we could share the good news of the King of kings and Lord of lords and get people born again through the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we must share our faith daily and at all times. We must bring people to Jesus at the coffee shop, in the grocery store, at Planet Fitness, at the gym, in our neighborhood, at work, playing golf and playing tennis, wherever and whenever at work we need, to, we need to come and we need to tell people about Jesus and build the kingdom of God. There was a young lady in our church. She was at Planet Fitness and guess what she did? She witnessed to a young lady and that young lady came to know Jesus as her personal Savior and Lord. I sat there and I said yes. I got a text today from another lady. She said Pastor, I've been in the church for 15 years and I'm finally, you're finally rubbing off on me. I want you to know for the first time in my life I witnessed to somebody at Publix and told them about Jesus Christ. I was so scared and I was so nervous. But how many of you know, I said, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. How many of you know that's what Christianity is all about? Can you say amen? Christianity is not just about attending church. Because you need to understand that when we attend church, it's usually a bunch of born-again believers. Once in a while, some unbelievers come in because the church is for believers. The church is to teach the gospel to believers. And then what do we do? We deploy out into the community. And wherever we go, we are a witness to the King of kings and Lord of lords. How many of you want to see revival and renewal and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a Tampa Bay area? 
I don't believe it. Come on, how many of you want to see revival and renewal and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Tampa Bay area? I don't know if I believe you yet. Come on, how many of you want to see revival and renewal and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Tampa Bay area? Do you really want to see it? Okay, are you ready? How's it going to happen? You got to go tomorrow. You got to start tomorrow. You got to tell people about Jesus. You say, I'll see you Sunday. That's good. But guess what? You got to start witnessing. You got to start sharing your faith. We all have to start telling people about Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor Strayer, I'm scared. Take authority over that spirit of fear in the name of Jesus and tell people about the King of kings and Lord of lords. So what are we here to do? We are here to build the kingdom of God. I think it's very important that we realize that. Not every person who gets saved will attend a church. Not every person who gets saved will attend this church. But we're not called to build a church. We are called to build the kingdom of God and get people saved and born again and let God do with them what he wants to do with them. So I want to share with you some points about bringing people to Jesus. We need to bring people to Jesus. I call it this. We need to be a God magnet. Isn't that true? We need to be a God magnet. We need to attract people to the Lord. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5. Now remember, these five principles that I've been sharing and teaching, the fact they're in the book, it's time for a breakthrough. Please get that. Share it with another pastor. Share it with an individual. Very, very important. Those five principles have to be in every church in America, in the world, but specifically in America. If they are, you'll see God do great and awesome things. Here we see number one, bringing people to Jesus. Remember these four men brought people to Jesus. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Bring them to Jesus. Witness, get them saved, plant seeds, and let the Lord do what he wants to do. Point number one tonight, every believer has the joy and responsibility to bring people to Jesus. How many of you understand that you don't pay a pastor to do all the work of the harvest? Hey, pastor, you do it all. No, I do what I, I do. What the Lord wants me to do. When I'm out in the harvest field, I tell people about Jesus. I get people saved. I don't count the salvations that occur in the church service. How many of you know I am simply a born-again believer with the office of pastor? And when I'm out in the community, I'm not saying I do it every time, but a lot of the times I share with everybody the good news of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you want to see people saved? Do you want to see people go to heaven? Do you want to see their lives change? It only comes by being a witness. And every believer has the joy and responsibility to bring people to Jesus. But Pastor Strayer, I'm not an evangelist. But look with me, if you would, please, at chapter 4 and verse 5 of 2 Timothy. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions. And what does it say then? Come on, everybody, tell me what it says. So what is every believer supposed to do? Yes, do the work of an evangelist. No excuses. There are no excuses. Pastor, I'll pray about it. No, no, no. It's an act of obedience. The Lord says to go, we obey. You say, Pastor, no one will listen. That is not true. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says God has placed eternity in their heart. Everybody who is born and has been born, the Lord has placed eternity in their heart. That means God has set them up for you to go to to tell about the Lord. They want to hear about eternal life. They want to hear about life after death because everybody knows that they are going to die. Where are they going when they die? All of those eternal subjects, people are ready to hear you say, why? Because God puts eternity in their hearts. How many of you are glad God has set everybody up that we can share the good news? Now you say, well, they won't accept. It's not our responsibility to save anyone. It's our responsibility to tell everyone the good news of Jesus Christ and let God save them. You say, Pastor Strayer, I am afraid. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. How many of you are a little bit fearful of witness? seen and sharing your faith. Can I see your hand lifted high up in the air? Some of you are afraid to put your hand high up in the air. Come on, lift your hand up as high as you possibly can. See, there's a little fear. Leave it up with me if you would, please. Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over that spirit of fear that has stopped people from sharing the good news of the Lord. Father, we can do it, and I pray that you would touch them right now. I pray that, Lord, you would remove that spirit of fear, and I pray at the right time, at the proper time, Lord, even if their words aren't the best, that, Lord, they would tell somebody about Jesus. Christ, the Son of the living God, and it's going to start, and there's going to be testimonies from everyone telling people how seeds have been planted, how people's lives have been touched, and we give you glory and honor and praise for it. In Jesus' name, the fear is God. Now go get them in Jesus' name. Go get them in Jesus' name. 
Pastor Strayer, I just can't do it. Yes, you can. Come on, God's people. Put on some victory clothes. Start talking some victory talk, and you can do it. You say, Pastor Strayer, but I'm only one person. So wasn't John the Baptist. John the Baptist was one person, and in six months, he led 250,000 people to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 45,000 people a month came to know the Lord. How many of you know one person could do damage against the kingdom of darkness? Can you say amen? Yes, they can. Come on, everybody declare with me. I can witness. I can share my faith. I can bring people to Jesus. I can plant some seeds. Come on, share it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Somebody's going to get saved soon. Somebody's going to be changed soon. In Jesus' name, amen. We receive it. We believe it. Do all of you believe that one person can make a difference? Can you make a difference? Can I make a difference? Yes. Let me read a little story here. I don't do it much because I like the word better than stories. Ed was a Boston carpet salesman and a Sunday school teacher at Mount Vernon Congregational Church. He taught teenage boys the Bible. One 18-year-old boy in his class did not seem interested in spiritual matters, often falling asleep in church and having complete ignorance of the Bible. He must have attended first service if he fell asleep. Ed was concerned about the boy's spiritual destination. Nothing against first service people, by the way. Ed was concerned about the boy's spiritual destination, so he built up his courage one April morning, and he determined to share the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus with this young man. And this young man worked as a clerk in Holton's Shoe Store in downtown Boston. Ed was no seasoned evangelist. In fact, he was so nervous that he initially walked right past the store. Reconsidering his plan, maybe talking about Jesus while the young man was at work was not the appropriate time or place. Maybe he should wait, but something inside of Ed said now was the time. What was that inside of Ed? It was the Holy Spirit. He offered a quick prayer under his breath, Lord, help me. And he turned on his heels, and he went through the door. He found the clerk in the back of the store, placing his foot on a shoebox and a hand on the boy's shoulder. Ed said, I came to tell you about how much Jesus loves you. They talked for a few minutes, and then the clerk knelt and professed his faith in Jesus Christ. Later, the clerk wrote about that moment. I was in a new world. The birds sang sweeter. The sun was shining brighter. I have never known such a peace in my life. The young man Ed spoke of with that day was Dwight L. Moody, whose name who went on to become one of the greatest evangelists in the 19th century. Moody later had an encounter with the Lord with another young man by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman on the assurance of his salvation. Chapman then became a Presbyterian minister and evangelist who greatly influenced an ex-baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday. With his brash and flashy style, Sunday led thousands upon thousands upon thousands to Christ during his evangelistic crusade. In 1924, in Charlotte, North Carolina, Billy Sunday held a rally during which many men and women were saved. Out of that campaign came the formation of the Charlotte Businessman's Club, which continued to evangelize that region of the state. In 1943, this organization organized a series of meetings in Charlotte and invited a man named Mordecai Ham. How many of you are glad your name is not Mordecai Ham? Can you say amen? Invited him to preach. It was at one of those meetings that another 15-year-old young man committed his life to Christ. His name was Billy Graham, a man who preached the gospel to more people around the world than any other evangelist. In 1953, two years before I was born in Dallas, Texas, Billy Graham had an evangelistic crusade during which my mother gave her life to Christ. This is the author saying it. In a very real sense, I am a follower of Christ and serving in ministry today because of an ordinary 19th century carpet salesman in Boston who allowed himself to be used by God in an extraordinary way. Woo! Come on, that's worth giving the Lord praise, isn't it? Every time I witness now, and I don't do it for any alternative reason, I said, Lord, this could be the next great evangelist. This could be the next great preacher on TV. This could be the next great missionary. This could be the mom of a child that's going to be born that is going to end up being one of the greatest pastors that has ever lived. How many of you know you never know who you are going to touch with the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? 
This man could be saved and he's homeless and he doesn't even know he's saved. He doesn't even remember it happening, but he might raise up to start a homeless ministry that will affect thousands in the United States of America. This man could be on crack cocaine. This man could have taken fentanyl, almost dying, but God raised him up and now he is over a ministry and building homes across our land that young men and women can be saved and born again and get a job and get healed. How many of you know you never know who you are witnessing to? You never know. Turn to somebody and say, go get them, go get them. Go get them, go get them. Luke chapter 19 in your Bibles, Luke chapter 19. Turn to somebody behind you and say, you can make a difference. You can make a difference. i got to ask you then, does anybody want to make a difference? No, really, do you want to make a difference in your life? Oh, man, eternally. Then tell people about Jesus. Luke chapter 19 and verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. I've been there a couple times since I've been in Israel twice. And behold, so there is a real city named Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who worked for the IRS. I don't, they need to be saved, don't they? Man, these taxes are getting expensive, aren't they? Wow. Now behold, there was, how many of you are glad that the Lord saves tax collectors? I'm really glad that he saves tax collectors. Now behold, how many of you know if he saves them, maybe they won't make us pay taxes? Wouldn't that be awesome if they would drop the taxes? Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was very rich. Why was he rich? He was ripping people off is what he was doing. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd because he was a very short guy. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into the sycamore tree. When you go to Israel, there is a sycamore tree in the in Jericho, and they say that's the same one that Zacchaeus climbed up into. Now, I don't think that's true, but that's what they say. And you can see it for $5. So here we go. And he climbed, he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and he said to him, How many of you understand that before you were saved, Jesus had his eyes on you? Jesus saw exactly what you were like. He saw Bobby and Drew doing drugs. He saw Bobby drinking. He saw Bobby doing all those foolish things. I can't speak against her. I'm not speaking against her. How many of you know the Lord saw all of us doing all that stupid type of stuff? How many of you know his eyes were on you? That's how much he loved you. And his eyes were there. They were on Zacchaeus. So he ran and climbed up into the sycamore tree. And when Jesus came, he looked up and saw him. And he said, Zacchaeus, come on quickly. Get down out of that tree. For today I must come, and I'm going to stay at your house. So he made haste, and he came down. Would you underline the next four or five words there? He received him joyfully. How many of you know Zacchaeus, the tax collector, got saved and born again? And when you get saved and born again, how many of you know the joy of the Lord is complete and full in your life? He changes you. And he received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, says, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is sinner. Oh, Jesus loves the lost. He loves the lost. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I will give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore fourfold. Pastor, how do you know Zacchaeus got got saved? How do you know he was born again? Because there's fruit. When somebody is truly born again and really saved, there is fruit that comes in their life. They are different. They stop their drugging. They stop their drinking. They stop their cussing. They stop their old behavior. And God totally and completely changes them. There is fruit. Even the day you get saved, there might be a little leaf that pops up. Boom! But there's going to be some fruit in your life. If you're here saying, you know what? I'm saved and born again, but I still go to the bars. I still treat. I still cheat. I still drug. I still go out on my wife, etc. Again, I can't judge you, but there's a good chance that you are not born again and saved. Because when you are born again and saved, you receive him joyfully. You turn from your sins. You turn to Jesus. And all of a sudden, fruit is in your life to prove and to show that you are born again through the blood of Jesus. Is anybody saved today? Oh, good, all the hands aren't up. We're going to have a great altar call. Is anybody saved today? Are you ready? Here's what I say in my office. Are you ready? When I ask them if they're saved, they say yes. I say, okay, prove it. Let's see a little bit of fruit. Hello, let's see a little bit of fruit. How many of you have a little bit of fruit that's popping up in your life once in a while? That's how you know and others know that you are born again and I'm born again. And Jesus said to him, today. 
Salvation has come to this house. How did the Lord know it? Because he gave half of the goods to the poor, and he took from anyone by false accusation. He restored it fourfold. Jesus said, today salvation has come. Today repentance has come. Today there has been a change in your life. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost, those who don't know Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. Why in the world does the body of Christ exist? Why in the world did the Lord plant CCWC and other churches here and across America? I say this so lovingly, not just to have church services that people could come to church. Although the Lord wants churches, he wants people to come and gather together. But what we have to realize is this. Jesus came to seek and to save those that are lost. Why are we here? To seek and to save those who are lost and need Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. You see, I realize something as a born-again believer and as a pastor. How many of you understand that people can change things on their own? They can change things on their own. How many of you know people can quit smoking and not be saved? People can eat lettuce and chickpeas and lose weight and get healthy. How many of you know chickpeas are terrible? Aren't they? They are terrible, aren't they? Yes, they are. How many of you know you can change your attitude? Isn't that true? You can change your attitude. How many of you know you can quit drinking on your own? But point number two is this. Why do we bring people to Jesus? We bring people to Jesus because he is the only person who can break the power of sin and save anyone. If I have a bad attitude tonight, and I don't, how many of you know I can change it? If you have a bad attitude, and I won't ask you if you do, but if you do, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I'll say, no, I'm not going to pray for you. You just need to change your stinking attitude and have a good attitude in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? And I know you can. You say, how do you know I can change it? Because when I call people in the church on the phone, and they answer a little bit angrily, and they answer, ang- and they answer a little bit frustrated, and then all of a sudden when they see on the phone, and when they answer the phone, and they hear that it's me, how many of you know they change their tude real quickly? You can be in a great argument with your wife, and guess what happens? Oh, Pastor Strayer, how you guys doing? Better than ever. How's your marriage? Oh, man, it's fantastic. We were just planning a date that we're going to take tonight. How many of you know you can change your attitude just like that? You can do it on your own. You can change. You can quit drinking. You can lose weight. You can do a lot of things on your own, but there's one thing that you can't do. You can't break the power of sin and save anybody. Only Jesus Christ can do that. The paralytic in Mark chapter 2 represents sin. He was paralyzed by sin, and he also had a health issue. But only Jesus could break the power of the sin, and it is the number one problem of every human being. I know you've heard me say this over the years, and I don't do it to bore you. The problem with every human being is not their symptoms. Christians fight symptoms. And when we fight symptoms, we get frustrated, and we get mad, and we get angry. We are not fighting symptoms. We are fighting the main problem of every human being, which is the sin nature. The sin nature can only be broken through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Focus on the Lord. Focus on the sin nature. Don't fight the symptoms of sin. Quit fighting the trans issue. Quit fighting the abortion issue. Quit fighting the hatred issue. Quit fighting the sinful lifestyles. Quit fighting the abuse. Get people born again and get people saved. They will not have an abortion again. They will not smack their wife again. They will not get drunk again. They will not do fentanyl again. They will not swear again. They will not prostitute their body again. They will be delivered. Hello, is anybody here tonight? Pastor, I just can't believe all the fentanyl. Yes, it is terrible, but it's the sin nature. And if you can get people saved and born again, they won't do cocaine. They won't do marijuana. They won't do fentanyl. They'll be born again. They will be set free through the blood of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So get the lost saved. And the Lord loves the lost. Do all of you love the lost? I love the people that I love people that are lost. It's awesome. And guess what the word lost means? It means to be out of place. 
That's what the word lost actually means, to be out of place. It's like a bone that's out of place, that they're lost. They are just limping along. They can't walk a straight line because they're limping. They're out of place. They can hardly walk. They are out of place, and only a doctor can put that bone back in place. You say, who is the doctor that can get them back in place and have that relationship with, with God? It's the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that can only help them and heal them and put that bone back in place that they can have everlasting life. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Turn to somebody and say, I love people that don't know Jesus. Oh, that was bad. That was really bad. Let's try that again. Turn to somebody and say, I love people that don't know Jesus. And you know, one of the problems is with all Christians, they don't know anybody that doesn't know Jesus anymore. Nobody knows any unbelievers. I don't want to be with them. How many of you know that's what we're here for? Jesus didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He came for unbelievers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 8. We bring people to Jesus by planting seeds. We bring people to Jesus by planting seeds. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 to 8. I, brothers and sisters in Christ, could not speak to you as spiritual people but as to carnal as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are carnal, you're fleshly. For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? If anybody says anything negative about any church, it's divisive. And how many of you know if they are divisive, they are carnal, they are not spiritual people, and you need to mark those people. It says here, for when one says, I'm of Paul, Another says, I'm Apollos. Aren't you not carnal? How many of you know we're not to follow men? We're to follow Jesus Christ. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers to whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, neither he who waters is anything, but it is God who gives the increase. You say, Pastor, what is your point? My point is this. We bring people to Jesus by planting seeds. Pastor Strayer, I go out and witness all the time and nobody's getting saved. That's not why you go out and share. You go out and share because God says, go out and preach the good news of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hear it a lot of times when people go out on outreaches here. Nobody came to the Lord. We can't bring people to the Lord. We can't get them saved. The purpose is not the purpose. Yes, we want them saved, but the outcome sometimes isn't them being saved. You have planted seeds in their lives. Most times it takes anywhere from seven to ten plantings of seeds in somebody's life to come to know Jesus. Are you ready? Quit being discouraged. Don't give up when you witness and nobody comes to know the Lord. You cannot save them. It's not your job to save them. It is our job to go and plant seeds. And if somebody gets saved, yes. If somebody doesn't get saved, yes. Because how many of you know we're winners all the way around? Are there any seed planters in this Thursday night service. The outcome of who and who doesn't get saved is not about us. Not everyone who gets witnessed to gets saved. You may not lead anyone to the Lord, but do not stop witnessing. We are just asked to plant seeds. We are not responsible for the outcome. Only Jesus Christ can save anyone. So there are some misconceptions, and I'll end with this, about evangelism. There are some misconceptions about evangelism, and I'll end. One misconception is this, that believers shouldn't be around unbelievers. That believers should not be around unbelievers. Turn with me back to Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. Always remember this, please. We are to have communion with believers. That's where we connect with people. But we are to have contact with with unbelievers. Did everybody get that? We are to have communion with believers, fellowship with them, hang out with them, uh, rub shoulders with them, etc. We want to be like Jesus, be like them, but have contact with unbelievers. And the church in America is losing contact with unbelievers, and that's why our nation keeps going down and down and down and down. You don't have communion, but how many of you know you can have some contact with the unbelievers that they can get saved? So we see here in Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. As Jesus passed by, he saw who? Another tax collector. Thank you, Jesus. 
as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, what? So he arose, and he followed him. And it happened as he was having dinner in Levi's house. I wonder what Jesus had for dinner. When he had dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and what? What? <laughs> Isn't Jesus awesome? Doesn't that just kind of get to you as a born again believer? I don't know any believers. I don't know any unbelievers. Jesus knew a lot of unbelievers. Jesus hung out with unbelievers. He connected with unbelievers. You say they're terrible people. How many of you know we used to be terrible people too? But aren't you glad somebody had contact with us and told us about Jesus that we could be saved and born again? Now what happened is he was dining in Levi's house. The many tax collectors and sinners also sat together, look at this, with Jesus. That means shoulder to shoulder. His disciples were also there, for there were many, and they followed him. There's always some religious people. There might be some here tonight going to give me an email. Send it to Pastor Tony, please, if you would. Saying, Pastor, I can't be with unbelievers. Yes, you can. You can connect with them. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, how many of you know he hears everything that you say? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well, who are saved, have no need of a doctor. But those who are sick, who do not know Jesus, who do not know me, I did not come to call the righteous to repentance. I came to call those who are unbelievers to repentance. There's a misconception that believers shouldn't be with or around unbelievers. God's people, to be Christ-like, we need to have the joy of Jesus. To be Christ-like, we need to have the love of Jesus. To be Christ-like, we need to have the kindness of Jesus. Are you ready for this? I'm setting you up. To be Christ-like, we have to have contact with unbelievers. Only two people clap, but that's okay. 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Here's the second mis misconception. The second misconception is this, that living a Christ-like life around non-Christians is enough. That just living a Christ-like life around non-Christians is enough. Pastor, you really don't need to talk to anybody. Oh, yes, you do. How many of you know you need to live for the Lord around people, but you also need to share your faith verbally? Here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, look what the Word of God says. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be what? To give a what? You know what that means? To speak. Always give ready to speak to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. I talk to everybody. Are you saved yet? Do you know Jesus yet? Family members, are you saved yet? Do you know Jesus yet? They're tired of me. That's okay. I want them to go to heaven. Do you know Jesus yet? Are you saved yet? Are you close to the Lord? Get back to Jesus with all of your heart. They don't like you. That's okay. It doesn't make any difference. Do you know Jesus yet? Are you saved yet? You annoy me. That's okay. That's one of my giftings. Do you know Jesus yet? Are you saved yet? Are you born again? How can you get mad at me for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with people that are out there? I live for the Lord, but you got to be verbal. I have never met one Christian yet who all they did was live for the Lord and never shared that have won anybody to the Lord. They're not doing a ding-dong for the kingdom. Live for Jesus, be godly, be holy, be righteous, but share that righteousness and share that godliness and share that holiness with people also at the same time. And number three, Mark chapter 1. Let's go back there and we'll end. I promise. Mark chapter 1. The last misconception is this, is that you shouldn't witness until your life is all it should be. You shouldn't witness until your life is all it should be. How many of you know that we can't really witness until our life totally lines up with the Word of God? 
until we've gone to classes, until we've gone to Bible school, until we have some training. Are you ready? Baloney. In the Greek, it's baloney. In the Hebrew, it's baloney. How many of you know the day that you get born again, the day that you get saved, the day that you come to know Jesus, guess what we should be doing? Go out there and telling people about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. You say, prove it spiritually in Bible. I can. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 44. A leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus was moved with compassion. He stretched out his hand and he touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was clean. That means he was healed and saved. And he strictly warned him and sent him away immediately. Hey, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest. It's like having a doctor verification of your healing. Offer and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But look at this. The day he saved, don't you love verse 45? However, he went out and he began to what? Come on, proclaim it how? And he began to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. This man said, Lord, I know what you're saying, that I'm not supposed to say anything you don't want me to because there'll be such a crowd you won't be able to go to another town, but I can't hold it in. I'm saved. I'm born again. I am healed. I am changed. I got fruit. I don't do drugs anymore. I don't do alcohol anymore. I don't abuse my wife anymore. You've changed my lips. You've changed my heart. You've changed my mind. I'm saved. I got to let anybody, everybody know that Jesus is my Savior. Lay hands on somebody next to you, if you would, please. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I speak boldness, a spirit of boldness into all of us. I speak a spirit of boldness into all of us. I speak a spirit of boldness into all of us, Lord. Not that we would be weird, not that we would be annoying. But Lord, everybody else is, so we got to come out of our closet. And we got to let everybody know that Jesus is our Savior. Oh, some of us are scared because of the cancel culture. Some of us are scared because we might be, we might be kind of held away from our family members. They think we're nuts. Some of us are scared because we live in a neighborhood and there's neighbors that don't like us. Some of us are scared because we're shunned by people. But Lord, we're not letting the noise of the enemy and the cancel culture cancel us. With great love and with great compassion, with great grace and great truth and great mercy, we've got to share the gospel. we got to. Lord, I know everybody wants renewal, but it's going to come by people individually and personally going out and sharing the good news. Telling people about Jesus, God's people, start planting seeds. Do not be discouraged if nobody receives the Lord. Even if people turns away from you and gets mad at you, that's very small that that happens. But just keep sharing and just love them. And who knows, it could be like Bobby, that years down the line, they're going to come to Jesus. And they're going to remember that time when you talked to them on the street corner. That waiter or waitress is going to remember the time that you gave them a Jesus is the answer card. They're going to remember and they're going to come to know Jesus. We're going to build the kingdom. God's people, don't put drama on Facebook. Just share the gospel. Why don't you go home and just share the gospel? That's it. 1 Corinthians 15, just print it out. Here's the gospel. If anybody's not saved, you can get saved today. This is for family. This is for friends. This is for neighbors. Don't get into the with people. Use Facebook and use social media to spread the good news. Don't get involved in all the argumentative things. Don't get involved in all the cultural issues. Don't get involved in any of that. Just say, you need Jesus. You need to be born again. Give your testimony. Come on, let's share. Let's plant seeds. Let's see fruit come. Let's see people born again. And even if they're not, we're going to keep planting seeds and keep, quit plant, and keep planting seeds. And God's going to save and God's going to touch. Pray for that person next to you just for 10 seconds. And I really want you to pray and say, Lord, fill them with the spirit of boldness. Come on, some of you didn't pray. Come on, just pray it. Just fill me with the spirit of boldness. And secondly, say, Lord, fill, them, fill me with the spirit of love. Come on, the spirit of love, love and boldness, truth, 
Jesus said, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Pastor, I really believe they're saved. They're not going to church. Well, maybe not yet, but they're saved. Pastor, they're not coming to this church. They go to another one. Hey, they're saved. We're building God's kingdom. Building God's kingdom. So, Lord, we thank you and honor you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, with no one moving around, whether you're upstairs, downstairs, online. Again, it's not our responsibility to save anyone. And I've been praying this. I'm still praying it for years. Lord, let most of the salvations, if not all, let them happen outside of the church. I'm so glad that people are witnessing at Publix. I'm so glad at Planet Fitness. A woman was led to the Lord, and this family brought the woman to church then. That's so awesome. That's what this is about. Thank you, Lord. I heard somebody say, thank you, Lord. Was that Sam up there? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, if there's one person who has come in tonight that does not know you, save them, Lord. Save them, Lord. If they're upstairs in the cafe, if they're online, Lord, if they're here, Lord, seated, seated in the sanctuary, save them, Lord, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, God's people. My last point tonight was we got to bring people to Jesus because this is an eternal matter. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I know you don't even hear those words said much anymore concerning hell on TV or whatever, but there is a heaven and there is a hell, and God never prepared hell for a person. He prepared hell for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25. He wants you to go to heaven. He created it so big, there's enough room for everybody who has ever been born to go to heaven. He wants you saved. Father, if there's anyone here, if there's anyone, Lord, on the soccer field, any children, any parents who are out there, and the youth, middle school and high school tonight as they meet, Lord, I pray that you would save them, Lord. Save them. Save them, Father, we pray. Is there anybody here? You'll slip a hand up in the air and you'll say, I just need Jesus. I want to make sure that I'm saved before I leave this place. I want to make sure that I know him as my personal Savior and Lord. And man, he'll save you and he'll change you and he'll forgive you. Just slip that hand high up in the air. Don't be ashamed. Don't be scared. Say, I need the Lord and he'll touch your life. Father, you know every heart. You know every person that's here. One, And if there's one, even after the service, save them, Lord. But Lord, we are now not only meeting on Thursday and Sunday, but we're deploying to our neighborhoods, to our workplaces, Lord. And we're going to share the good news, Father. And we thank you for it and honor you for it in the name of Jesus. Can we put our hands together and thank the Lord for his goodness? Come on, Team Jesus. Go get them. Go get them. Hey, don't forget tonight. As you go out, we have those free Jesus is the Answer cards. Take hundreds of them. Don't just keep them in your house. Hand them out to everybody. Let everybody know that Jesus is the answer. God bless you. Have a great night tonight. If you're new to the church, we've never met you before, please come on upstairs. Take the front stairs. Take the elevator. Come on up. We want to meet you and greet you. Let you know it's good to have you in the house of the Lord. Have a great night tonight. Follow Jesus.